Thank you for the introduction. Uh, good morning. So my name is uh, Kaver Anjwar, and uh, I'm in this presentation, I'm going to take you through the technical services provided by RIPNCC. And by technical services, uh, I mean mostly global services, so which are accessible by everyone, not only RIPNCC members, although in many cases, uh, our members have some advantages. So I will quickly go through RIPE Atlas, KROOT expansion, and then our DNS services, RIPE stat and research. This is a high level overview, but please, if you have any questions, uh, I would be more than happy to answer them uh, after the presentation. So let's just start with RIPE Atlas. Uh, you heard a lot uh, about RIPE Atlas uh, yesterday uh, in the morning session. Uh, it's a large active measurements network with about uh, 8,300 active probes uh, at any given time. So uh, basically you can use this network to, to measure from any, any of these probes to any destination in the world, including the probes, but any other destination as well. Uh, we have also 130 ac uh, active RIPE Atlas anchors. These are the more stable machines which are designed for data centers. Uh, the important thing about uh, RIPE Atlas is all the history is preserved. So when you do a measurement, it's, uh, it's in the system. You and others can access it. And uh, all of the history without any aggregation, like some of the other tools, is present. So you can come back like three years ago, the ping was exactly this, uh, with minimum, with maximum, and with, uh, with average and median. Uh, so only last year, we did 79 billion measurements. And when I say we did, it's basically some of, some of them are done by us, some of them are done by the system automatically, and a lot of them are done actually uh, by the end users of the system. And uh, we do four kind of, or Actually, as of uh, now or as of last month, we do five types of measurements. We do pings, trace routes, uh, you can do DNS measurements, SSL measurements, and now you can also do NTP measurements. We are working on HTTP and HTTPS measurements. Uh, there will be an article this week on RIPE Labs explaining how we are going to approach that. Uh, and we have also introduced data streaming last month. Data streaming is where you can basically get uh, near real-time uh, data out of Atlas. So when you s start a measurement or any other measurement that someone else has started, you can look into that and get the data as they come into the system. We also have open API, so you can build tools on top of uh, RIPE Atlas uh, and customize it the way you like. And there has been a huge community uh, contribution to the whole system. Uh, if you go to GitHub, RIPNCC's uh, GitHub, uh, you can see that there are many contributions. We recently had a hackathon uh, about two months ago, and in the hackathon, we also got 11 projects uh, from the community, which are all open source and all on the GitHub. So this is where we are. Uh, this, is a, this is the total number of probes, and the red one uh, is the ones which, are not act which were not active when we took this picture. And this is the map of uh, RIPE Atlas anchors. So with anchors, uh, it was also uh, asked yesterday. Uh, it's really good if you host an anchor. So I won't go into, again, all the details that Christian explained yesterday, but if you look in the, basically in the eastern, sorry, uh, in the eastern part of Russia, there is no anchors. And there are many multiple advantages to having them, aside from technical ones which were explained yesterday. Uh, there is also a logistical one, or let's say strategic one, because uh, when you put an anchor, there is a lot. There will be a lot of data about your connectivity available uh, to to third parties, and they can use it uh, to either plan expansion and then say, "Oh, there is there is opportunity here to to add more bandwidth or connectivity, new fiber," or if they see there is already good connection, they will consider it for adding more services. This is what, for example, we worked with Wikipedia uh, to help them to locate their servers and uh, Wikimedia, which runs Wikipedia, and uh, decide how to route customers to which servers in uh, where in the world and if there was an anchor, for example, in east of Russia, they might have considered, I'm just saying as a scenario, they might have considered uh, putting, putting a machine there as well. And this happens globally for, for multiple providers. So I strongly suggest you, if you're operating, especially in central and eastern parts of Russia, uh, uh, please, if you have a data center, talk to us and we can work with you to, to have an anchor installed in your data center. So with Atlas, uh, just a uh, high level update. We aim to reach 10,000 active probes this year, uh, and this should provide a statistically relevant uh, sample of the internet. So at the moment, we cover about 14.5% of IPv6 uh, ASNs and 6.7, uh, if I'm not wrong, percent of IPv4 ASNs. We hope to, to get to 10% of active IPv4 ASNs uh, with that 10,000, but we really don't know. 
uh, it is hard to guess because it depends. We might have 100 deployed in one ASN or we might have 100 in 100 different ASNs. We're also working on a new generation of probes and it's a complex problem. Uh, the cost is one, one part, capabilities, uh, the import issues to, because this is a global thing, we have to be able to ship it all around the globe. Um, but one important thing that we, we have committed to based on the feedback from the users on the mailing list is uh, we are going to go for support, uh, supporting Wi-Fi measurements. Wi-Fi measurements is basically looking if there is a Wi-Fi network, uh, basic, it will be an opt-in feature, so it's just not going to be scanning for Wi-Fi by default, but then it will, uh, if people enable it, it will scan for Wi-Fi networks, uh, try to see what's available, and uh, also will try to log in if there is credentials provided, uh, because some operators actually run a global uh, authorization, synchronized authorization system all within a country or within a region. So they, with this, they can actually test if the network is working properly. Uh, Budget-wise, because RIPE Atlas was a project which initially started with support of uh, RIPE NCC membership, but we have a commitment to basically make the project financially uh, sustainable on its own. And uh, for, for next year budget, we already have 20% reduction and we will continue the same trend for next two years. So basically, we are reducing, uh, we are trying to make sure that we can expand the project, so it's, we are not going to make the project smaller, uh, but we're looking for other means of funding. Uh, or from Already from last year, we didn't purchase any probes uh, from membership money. We only solely based the purchase of probes uh, on assistance from inter interested parties, and we are going to continue the same this year. And uh, we're also working more to get funding from, from organizations who are interested. We also worked over uh, to, get, to get more operational efficiency in the running the whole project. So with that, I will get uh, to KROOT expansion project. <clears throat> we are one of the f uh, 12 operators of the uh, root, uh, root system. There are 13 uh, instances, but one organization, VeriSign, runs two, uh, two instances, so there are 12. Uh, actually, out of those 12, only three are outside uh, US, I mean, operated by an organization which is not US-based. And one of, one of them uh, is us, the other one is uh, NetNote, uh, who are also one of the sponsors of uh, this meeting. Uh, so two Europeans, and one uh, is White Project in Japan. So. Uh, we really want to expand uh, our presence, uh, in the, especially in our service region. Uh, historically, we ran five core nodes in Miami, in Amsterdam, Frankfurt, Tokyo, and London. And these nodes were like really big machines um, taking more than half a rack with uh, two routers, two switches, three servers. So very redundant setup. A lot of bandwidth, open peering policy. And we also had uh, local nodes, uh, one, one for example in, in Russia where uh, we, we still had a lot of equipment there, switches, routers, uh, machines, but the smaller than the, co uh, the uh, global ones. Um, this involved a lot of work, a lot of hardware from our side, a lot of space, bandwidth requirements, uh, stability requirements from, from the hosts, and also a lot of resources in managing all the peerings. So we thought we should come up with a, with a new model so we can expand that easily, which is more efficient, both financially and resource-wise for, uh, for us and also the people who want to host them. This is a map of where the current uh, KROOT nodes are uh, installed. And with the new model, we are basically uh, come up with a single box solution. There is one, uh, one U or two U machine, a Dell machine, which has everything on it. So the machine does access uh, also a router. It speaks BGP and it runs uh, the DNS uh, system. Uh, it's very easy to set, uh, set up and we only peer with the organization that's going to host, uh, host the instance, which means there will be a lot less uh, pressure on the managing the peerings. Uh, it's also fully automated after the setup. Basically, the node is completely run completely automated with, uh, with the scripts that we have. Anything happens to node, it automatically gets out of the network. Uh, we looked at the real situations, like in many parts of Central Asia or mostly most of Central Africa or North Africa. There are data centers that even don't have uh, power the whole week with all the backup and everything they have. Uh, with this system, basically we don't care. If it goes down, automatically, without user's notice, we switch to other, uh, other nodes. And uh, the maintenance is really low, both for us and the host. Uh, which means uh, 
it, it makes us to expand the network much more easily and much more uh, reliable, reliably. So if you have, if you're operating a network uh, in Russia, especially again in uh, central and eastern parts of Russia, please talk to us. We would be more than happy to work with you to host a K-root instance. There is uh, no root, uh, no K-root instance other than the single one that we host with MSKIX in Russia, and we would really like to have more. And there are, there are a few benefits for the host, few benefits for us. So uh, it's, it's a piece of uh, internet core infrastructure, basically. So if you're interested in hosting, please let us know. Other than pro uh, operating Kroot, we, we do other we provide other DNS services as well. <coughs> we are the authoritative DNS uh, for uh, the reverse uh, uh, zone in, in the RIPE region. That's all the IP addresses in the RIPE region for IPv4 and IPv6. And uh, we are also providing secondary services for 77 CCTLDs, most of them within our region. So it's basically uh, a country operates uh, the country code uh, top level domain. If they want a backup uh, or a secondary, we, we operate that for them. So, uh, and uh, in, for, for running all of these services, uh, we have one provisioning site. The provisioning site is where we basically manage uh, the zone, edit the zones, and uh, keep, keep it up to date. We are working on a second one, which will be <coughs> operational end of July. We already sent announcements to, to all the CCTLE operators and uh, people who we host the reverse for them on our machines. But uh, if you're one of them, please talk to us or uh, check the updates on the uh, DNS working group because th with this update, there is a lot, uh, th there are some configuration changes you have to make. But after that, we will have two provisioning sites which will make us a lot more resilient. And uh, this service is announced from three Anycasted locations, uh, from uh, Amsterdam, Frankfurt, and uh, Stockholm. And we're also looking to expand that uh, possibly in the future. One interesting thing about the new Kroot and also this existing uh, DNS services we provide is we use three different name server setups. So we have automated systems. Uh, basically, randomly, I can say, you get to one of them, but you might get served by bind or not, uh, depending depending on uh, uh, on where, which location which location you are and which instance you get into. And uh, we also did this uh, for the new K, and we are the only one operating this way. This gives us the leverage that if there is a security pr problem, for example, with bind, we can just take bind out of the equation. With just one restart to a machine, we can switch to another name server. And again, yesterday you heard a lot about RIPESTAT. It's a very valuable tool for network diagnostics and uh, analysis. It's basically a web-based presentation of uh, routing data in a nutshell. Uh, but we also it, it also aggregates uh, routing data, registry data, abuse information, bandwidth, geolocation, and RIPE atlas data. And uh, this aggregating can be very interesting, especially when it's presented uh, on grouping. So we provide groupings uh, at the moment based on ASNs, countries, host names. Uh, uh, you can actually type in a country code. This is something that a lot of people miss. And you get a lot of information about that country. We are also working to add other groupings based on regions. For example, uh, we had a request actually from Russia to be able to look at uh, provinces. Uh, so we are working on that. Same same for US to look in, to look into a specific state. Uh, and uh, we are thinking about other ways of grouping. For example, bigger regions, OECD region, or let's say Middle East, and uh, based, even based on operators, especially for global operators. Uh, it also provides a unique aggregation of information, uh, mostly routing information, but also other, other information with preserving the history, and I will show a sample of that shortly. Uh, and we also operate services based on RIPE Atlas. So we have a global network monitoring service uh, based on RIPE Atlas, which is unique, and I encourage you to start using it, because normally when you, when you monitor your network, you monitor from within your network, maybe to rest of the world and or, or other locations you have. But with using this service, you can basically from rest of the world monitor your network and uh, get alerts in your monitoring system. If there is an issue, for example, connectivity from China or from Brazil, you can immediately get an alert in your in Isinga, Nagios, or whatever monitoring system you use. And we also operate DNS Mon, which is a world-class uh, TLD monitoring system used by many uh, TLD operators. So these are two examples of stat just for the country are you. Uh, yeah. On the right, you basically have, uh, this is uh, IPv4 resources used in Russia, or registered basically in, uh, in Russia. And uh, 
as you can see, if it's readable, it's about 7,000 resources uh, here in, uh, in Russia. And you can get the whole list, you can do search on them, and you can sort based on different uh, options. And this other one is uh, country routing statistics. So you can see actually how many pre IPv4 prefixes were announced, and as of yesterday, there were about 23,000, and how many ASNs were uh, announced uh, from, uh, from Russia. And uh, you can also infer data from that. So for example, you can see about, uh, there are 7,000 resources registered, but there are 23,000 uh, prefixes being announced, which means there is a ratio of 3.1 uh, between the registration and then the aggregation for the announcements. And this is higher than the global average, which is uh, 2.6, and uh, for example, in the US is 2.1. And it's interesting to look into why. And that basically takes me to а, собственно говоря, вот почему я пошел к исследованиям. Мы, я работаю в исследовательской команде. One is uh, events, so when there is a BGP leak or uh, effects of IPv4 runout uh, and the policies, for example, uh, or events like World Cup or earthquakes and things like that. And we look at how they affect the internet and the usage uh, for, for uh, and the usability of the services for the end users. We also look into interesting trends. So, uh, for example, IPv6 uptake. Uh, or aggregation and routing table, or more interestingly, we published a report uh, last month uh, about IPv4 transfers over the past two years within the RIPE NCC region. And we also work closely with researchers around the globe. Uh, from time to time, if there is a specific project or there is, uh, there is need for help, we work with them. For example, at the moment, uh, we are working with George Michelson from APNIC to do some research and see where we can do uh, cooperative work. So that's basically concludes uh, that concludes my presentation and if there's any questions I would be more than happy to answer them oh there is one Rape NCC uh, redesigned its website recently. Yes. And actually, a lot of people, including me, got confused. OK, actually, we could research what we do now uh, with our registrations, with our objects, or something like that. But may, maybe you can tell something about uh, advantages of new design and uh, future development. Thank you. Okay, uh, two points. Uh, one, uh, thank you for the question. There is, uh, there is actually, there was a presentation in a RIPE meeting which is archived, so, and, and there were also a few questions regarding that, so I strongly suggest you also look into that. But uh, basically the design, uh, there was a long process to come up with a new design. There were a lot of testing, end user testing, and A-B testing. Uh, and based on that, we came up with, with this design. It's much easier to find information. The problem is we have huge amount of documents on the website, and we want to keep all of them. So there is about 10,000 uh, 10, documents which are deprecated, but they should be preserved. And that makes search or finding relevant information really hard. So we really wanted to find a solution for that. Uh, and the other thing is uh, looking at the statistics and also how users navigated the old site. We saw that there is a lot of room for improvement. Uh, we also tried, we communicated that uh, in my point of view, personal view, it's uh, very well because uh, there was a labs article published three months before and then one month before even with the sneak preview. So we try to keep the community informed. Um, and the new one has multiple advantages. I will point out only one which is very useful, at least to me and I know um, uh, many working group members and chairs, is basically when you, when you look at a policy uh, on the right side, you get an immediate way to compare uh, uh, like the latest revision with the older, uh, older uh, revisions. And this is very useful, so you can immediately spot changes in policies. This is only one. Also, the search function has uh, improved a lot. Uh, previously, it was basically impossible. We got that from many people, including myself, to find anything with the old search. But the new search is uh, very effective. And uh, there is also a very useful option there. By default, the archived documents, which is deprecated documents, are not searched. But you have a tick box where you can also look into them, which makes the search searching much more efficient. But anything new is hard to adjust to. I also had my own 
issues adjusting to the new one, but after like a few days, now I'm very fully comfortable with that. It's, uh, it's more modern. We had the old one for almost 10 years, uh, so, or less, eight, eight years, but still. Uh, this, is, this is more uh, accurate for mobile phones, uh, easier to use on mobile phones, easier to search, and... Uh okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, really, probably you uh, saw, you noticed that the RAP Institute site was uh, changed in, in the right meeting. We had a big presentation about it, which I saw this presentation of this website. But if you pay attention, you can go and see, and uh, they tell about it in very possible detail. And uh, uh, early at the 10th Enoch, it's not 10 years, five years about, but we still have an old website. Uh, could uh, Ripe NCC help us improve our website? Are there any plans on this? So, uh, first of all, I'm not uh, an expert or in charge of that, but I'm sure we would, we would do more than that. It's, it's, uh, no, this, this is game, yes. George. <laughs> so, but, uh, yeah, but, but in general, we would be more than happy to, to, to help. I mean, uh, as a general policy, we support NOCs, uh, especially the successful and active ones like Enoch. Uh, Enoch has a brilliant history of like being successful, being active. So we would definitely try to, to do our best, and we will, if we can help, we would be more than happy to do that. Okay. If you feel that we are not responding to you and not very actively work on this kind, just ask us with start. Yeah, so for, for that and also for the website, if you have any suggestions and questions, please, please let any of us know. We will make sure it gets to the right, uh, right person. Because also for the website, we had the feedback, for example, for the search uh, button. By default, it searches the database, and then there is, you have to go for the website. And some people were not that happy with that. So we have already started doing A-B testing on that. So some people actually get a different search uh, method. And we are looking at the results and how much successful they are getting to the data. But it all comes from the feedback. So please give us the feedback. It's super useful. And you can talk to any of us, and we will make sure that it gets to the right person. Thank you, Ken. If I can add one thing, I think with all the features you're adding, and not just navigation, but search, it may be maybe useful to have some kind of pop-up hints or like, this is what's new, this is what changed. So when people log into the page first, I mean, access the page first, they see this. This is how the new search works, yes. or this is what you should now be able to do versus the old ways. And thanks, Alexander, for your suggestion. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I wonder, uh, please. Okay. Oh, no, 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 no. Thank you again.